Should I follow or just? Sure. Okay. As you wish. All right. So uh, thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. Is there anybody who hasn't got a copy of the homework for next week? Okay. Wow. Um, also, is there anybody who didn't get a chance to train in a homework assignment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So train with somebody else who also didn't get a chance to train yeah. in the show. And uh, draw the back. Yeah. Homework assignments? Raise your hand if you need a homework assignment. Yeah. Right, lots. They should just want to keep next to you and paper. Mm -hmm. Do it. Right, so what we're going to do today is, um, now that we did a whole bunch of kind of generic computer -y stuff for the last week, um, we're going to move on to talking about mathematics, which is what we'll do for the rest of the quarter. And, uh, oh, before I forget, there is a new cryptography seminar that Dan Shimo, one of the crypto grad students here, is starting. The first meeting of the seminar is tomorrow um, at 1.30 p.m., so, crypto, it's at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow, and it's in the Applied Math building, because they have a nice little room there, um, in 415 L, Ingenheim. And the speaker is a postdoc at Microsoft Research from Holland, so some Dutch guy. Um, <laughs> guy from MSR. <laughs> okay, so if you're interested in cryptography, you um, want, may want to go to this talk. And it's going to be on um, elliptic curves and some generalizations of ideas that are very relevant to counting the number of points on an elliptic curve over a finite field. So it's sort of um, <laughs> standard number theory <laughs> cryptography type stuff. At a, at a research level. Okay, so what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time that we have, which is only 30 minutes, are groups, rings, and fields. And I'm going to um, really just give you some, uh, I'm going to give you the formal definition of each of these things and then show you several examples and just make some general remarks. Okay? Um, some people in here will have already taken a course in algebra and know all about groups, rings, and fields. Other people here will have never seen a definition of groups, rings, or fields. And um, hence, well, for some people, this will seem pretty crazy. And for others, it will seem really basic. But here's the definition of a group, which, um, so, well, once you get used to it, it's just the most standard thing you can imagine. But at first, it seems kind of, um, I don't know, archaic and, and uh, abstract. But um, a group is just a set that has a way of really multiplying the elements in the set to get new elements in the set. That's what that math is, g cross g to g. It's a way of taking two elements of the set and getting another one. And there are a couple of axioms that you require that the elements of that set, along with that map, satisfy. Um, one is this associative law. Namely, if you multiply a and b and then times c, you get the same thing as a multiplied by b times c. Also, you require the basic identity element, so that when you multiply that element, the identity element, times anything in G, you get back that element, the, the anything element. Um, there's also an inverse. Given every element in G, there's some element, so that when you multiply the T, you get the identity element. So these are the axioms of a group. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples of groups. And um, one of the strange things about groups is you can very often uh, describe a set G, describe a map from G cross G to G, and say it's multiplication, but it can be a bit more work to verify that these axioms are actually satisfied. Um, but there are a huge number of different situations where you have this sort of structure, which you, many of which you've, probably most of which you've seen already. Um, you just didn't think maybe to call it a group. Uh, and there's one additional term. If you have a group and when you multiply an element, you can multiply it in other order and you get the same answer, then you call the group abelian. Um, so uh, we'll see examples that are and are not abelian in a moment. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of groups. I just noticed that 
everything seems to be in italics, which is really annoying. <laughs> um, I think I switched to italics mode right here and never turned it off. No, right here, identity element. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to fix that. Since otherwise the rest of the talk will be in italics, which will suck. Hmm, looks like uh, that didn't work. Ah, I did it twice. All right, so here's the first example in Sage of a group. Oh, let me hide all the output, otherwise it's no fun. Um, hide all output. Okay, so here's the first example. This is the symmetric group on three symbols. So this is an example of a particular set that satisfies those axioms. The set is, you take uh, three symbols, which I'll call one, two, and three, and you take all possible ways of permuting these three symbols. There are six different ways of doing that, and that collection of permutations is a group, where the group operation, the map from G cross G to G, is composition of permutations. So um, one example of a permutation maybe sends 3 to 2, 2 to 3, and fixes 1. That's a way of reordering these three symbols. Um, another permutation maybe sends 2 to 1, 3 to 2, and 1 to 3. That's another example of a permutation. And you can compose two permutations. You um, see where doing one permutation followed by the other sends each number, and that gives you a new permutation. So that's an example of a set equipped with a way of combining together two elements. And it, in fact, as it turns out, satisfies all of these axioms. The identity elements, the identity permutation. Um, if you have an, a permutation that has an inverse, that is a way of unpermuting and getting back where you started. And it's associative uh, because, well, really a permutation is just a function, a bijective function from the set to itself, and in complete generality, function composition is associative. So it's associative. And here's an explicit list in Sage of um, of the elements of this permutation group. There's a standard notation called cycle notation that's used to denote elements of a permutation group. And that's used throughout Sage. Most of the groups in Sage are permutation groups, where they're represented as permutation groups. And so uh, you have this notation. So for example, the cycle notation 2, 3, that means the permutation that sends 2 to 3, 3 to 2, and fixes 1. And uh, this means the permutation that sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1, and so on. If you took a course in abstract algebra, you'd get really, really good at multiplying permutations and so on. They're, they would become as friendly to you as matrices in a linear algebra class. Um, and it's a theorem that any finite group, any group set G that's equipped with an operation like that, um, that satisfies the group axioms, every single such thing can be embedded as a subgroup of a permutation group, where a subgroup is just a subset of some bigger group that is a group with the induced operation. So in a sense, every finite group is roughly of this form. It's something like this, or it's contained in something like this. It's an old, old theorem. Here's another example of a group. This is the group of symmetries mm -hmm. of a square. And uh, from Wikipedia, I grabbed a nice picture, which lists each of the eight symmetries of a square. And um, they're just different ways of taking a square picking it up and setting it down on top of itself. And, I mean, you can, like, doing nothing, that's the symmetry of the square. Rotating by 90 degrees, notice um, what happens is the blue, it's just the whole thing has been rotated one click to the right there, etc. If you take all possible symmetries, all eight of them, of a square, that set of symmetries is a group, where the um, composition law is you do one symmetry, then you do the next one. And that's a group you can compute with in Sage. It's called D4. And there it is. And you can list its elements. Here, the way it works is that instead of these colors, if you imagine labeling each of the vertices by numbers 1 through 4, 
every time you do one of these symmetries, that permutes the different vertices. So you can represent the elements of that group, of this, of this group of symmetries of a square, by giving a bunch of permutations. Um, there are generators. There's also a nice way of visualizing a group called its Cayley graph, given any group at all, and generators for that group. That is, a couple of elements of the group, so that by multiplying them together enough, you get the entire group. There is a graph, a set of vertices and edges. What you do is you put a vertex for every single element of the group, and then you draw edges, which you get from taking an element of the group and multiplying it by one of the generators, and, getting, and then drawing an arrow to the resulting other element of the group that you get. So here, there are eight different elements in the group, and this Cayley graph is got by taking each of those eight elements and multiplying it by um, each of the two generators of the group, which we happen to have fixed. So this gives you some way of visualizing uh, this particular group in one sort of fell sweep. Um, Bobby Moretti, who is an undergrad here, or who is an undergrad here, wrote the code that um, computes the Cayley graph, by the way. Uh, there's also a Cayley table. This is I think, just a multiplication table. All right, here's another example of a group. This is an abelian group. It's, um, it's just an abstract group, and it has 12 different elements. Um, it's generated by two things. One element, A, which has the property that when you square it, you get the identity, and another element, B, with the property that when you raise it to the power of 6, you get the identity. And then there are all ways of multiplying together. And uh, this, these are all the elements of the group. So that's an example of a group of order 12. Um, it's literally given by these symbols with the property that when you multiply them, anytime you see a squared, you just replace it by 1. Anytime you see b to the power 6, you replace it by 1. And you get to permute a and b. And that gives you a group. It's, just, it's not some like explicit thing like permutations of some object or uh, symmetries of some object, it's just some abstract thing. But, I mean, there are all the elements. If you have any two of these, I can tell you how to multiply them together, and you can check it satisfies the properties of being a group. And again, it's something you can compute with in Sage. So let's, uh, let's try this out. Um, so if I take A times B times A times B times A, and hit Shift Enter, what am I going to get? Which element in that list will I get? A times B squared. So why did you say that? So it just gets rid of the A squared because it's one, and then and then the B squared is just left there. So it's uh, it's just so it's a formal construction in Sage of an abelian group where A has order two, B has order six. That is, its six power is one. And these are all the elements. So the point of this example is just to show you that these groups can be viewed as just these purely abstract objects. And you can do arithmetic with them, and it's pretty useful. Well, I just showed you that it's useful, but it in fact is. Um, let's see. Here's an example of drawing the Cayley graph for this particular group of order 12, which I'll do right here. There it is. Um, so if nothing else, it's a uh, kind of cool that you can make a nice picture out of just this idea of taking an element of order 2 and an element of order 6 and sort of multiplying them together and letting things come in. If you made A an element of order 3, would it have... Um... What would it look like? That's a good question. She's asking, if I changed everything so that little A here has order 3, what's going to happen everywhere? So let's just try this out. That's an excellent question. So first, uh, has that structure. How many elements are we going to get when we list them? Um, what do you think? 18. 18, perfect. Um, there, a times a times a is 1. So notice that here you get just b squared. A, you get to commute the things. You get to, doesn't matter what order you do the arithmetic. So a times a times a is 1, and then b squared. Of course, that'll still be true. 
Now finally, let's see what the picture looks like. And, well, there's a picture there. It's a little hard to look at because uh, it's just, it's kind of, it is what it is. I mean, maybe what you were imagining. It's just you have to use your imagination a little more to move the vertices around in your head. But it looks like it may be just three, because, well, I don't know, there's some, I don't know, you didn't finish your sentence. Quite, so. um, it looks like I just put it on the inside of the one that was already there. Yeah, yeah, and you get all these little triangles. I wonder if you have little things like that. You're seeing some structure there. So. Okay. Um, another example of, an, of a group is the set of integers under addition. It satisfies all the axioms of a group. Um, and it's an abelian group. You can add integers in either order. And it's an infinite group. It's not a finite group. So you can't represent the integers under addition as permutations of some finite set. Because it's an infinite group. Another example uh, is integers modulo 12 under addition. That's an example of a group. So whenever you uh, say it's 7 o'clock and you wonder what time it'll be in you know, 8 hours, you're doing arithmetic in the group of integers modulo 12. Or you just use eight. Yeah, and then you don't have to, then you do, uh, see it's 3 o'clock if it's 7 o'clock, and then you add 8 hours, you get 3 o'clock. <laughs> And here are the elements right there. Um, what about if you take the integers modulo 12 under multiplication? So the number 0 up through 11 under multiplication. Is that a group? No. OK, the people who know that it's not a group already took group theory. <laughs> so they don't want to say anything. But just say something anyway, so it'll sound better on the camera. No inverses. Right, there's no inverses. What element doesn't have an inverse? Zero doesn't. Some elements do have inverses, but zero doesn't have an inverse. Um, not, not pretty much. Some other elements don't have inverses either. So that's a problem. Um, so it can't be a group. A group, one of the axioms of a group is every element has an inverse. So like with the integers under addition, five has an inverse, which is minus five, etc. cetera. Um, here's an example of a group of matrices. So it's a non-commutative group. This is the group of two by two matrices where the entries are zero or one. And whenever you multiply them, you have to reduce them mod 2. So you just um, take, you know, take whether they're odd or even. And here's a list of all the elements. Uh, there they are. So you get a whole bunch of, well, six different matrices. So this collection is six matrices where whenever you take two and multiply them, you always reduce mod 2, take the remainder. That's an example of a group. And it's a group of order six. It's um, Abstractly, it's isomorphic to that group I mentioned over here, S3, the group of symmetries of three things. Um, here's another example of a group. I'll skip this. And I'll skip this. And I'll skip that. Okay, on to rings. So that's groups. Groups are sets equipped with some way of combining two elements in the set to get a third element in the set. They come up in pure math all over the place, of course. They're also very popular in applied math um, and chemistry. I mean, people always talk about symmetry groups in chemistry. Um, molecules have uh, symmetries, which are very important to understand. Of course, groups are really important in physics. Uh, I was reading Outside Magazine uh, two days ago, and there's an interview with some surfer guy who was trying to understand the universe via understanding its relationship to a certain group. Etc. So you even read about um, groups in Outside Magazine. Um, so they are uh, all over the place, even outside. Um, so a ring is kind of the next level up from a group. It's again a set, but instead of just having one binary operation, you have two of them. It's a set with a map plus from the ring cross itself to itself, and a map dot or times from the ring cross itself to itself. And um, the plus map is supposed to give the ring an additive abelian group structure. Plus, or in addition, you also have a multiplication. In other words, um, a ring is just a group under addition, an additive abelian group. When I say additive, it's just the notation. I mean, I'm using plus to denote the group operation, um, which also has the property that you can multiply. But the multiplication doesn't have to be a group. In fact, it never will be a group because um, well, with the ring, you have a zero element, 
And since you're allowed to multiply and you have a zero there, you're just not going to get a group. So, so this is formally what a ring is. It's an additive abelian group plus you have the capability of multiplying in addition to adding. And then there are some axioms. The uh, multiplication is supposed to be just like an abelian group, except you don't require there to be inverses, which is just, I mean, you couldn't possibly require that because you have a zero element in the additive abelian group. So that's almost it. There's one other condition. You want there to be some relationship between addition and multiplication, and that's the distributive law. So you require that as well. Um, so let's see some examples of rings. So rings oh, please. Test. Is it a group of two operations? Yeah, it's like a group, but you have you throw in another operation. Uh, because, I mean, just think about it. You have the integers. That's under addition, that's that's a, a Boolean group. It's an example of a group. But come on, you, you have multiplication. You want to, don't want to forget about multiplication. Or the integers modulo 12. Um, under addition, they're a group. But there's still a, some sort of multiplication. What sort of properties does it satisfy? So a ring is like a group, plus you remember if it, if, if it also has some sort of multiplication, you remember that as well. You keep track of that as well. So it's a group plus a little bit more. Okay, it's an abelian group plus a little bit more. Um, and they're extremely ubiquitous in mathematics. I'll show you millions of examples of rings that you've encountered already. Um, before we go further, though, is the set of prime numbers a ring? Just to make sure you're awake. It's an easy question. Is the set of prime numbers a ring? Think of the poor camera people are out there going, wait, these guys aren't even answering that question. <laughs> is the set of prime numbers a ring? No, absolutely not. No. Uh, what about the set of natural numbers? All the numbers greater than or equal to zero. Is that a ring? No. Why isn't it a ring? No additive inverse. Exactly. No additive inverses. You can multiply elements. It, it you know, kind of kind of works fine almost from the point of view of multiplication up here, but unfortunately under addition it's just not in a group, a group at all. Like five doesn't have an inverse. <coughs> okay, but an example of a ring is the integers mod 12. Um, another example of a ring is the ring of polynomials. If you take all polynomials in one indeterminate over any other ring, say over the rational numbers, that gives you a ring. Of course, you can do arithmetic with polynomials. Another example of a ring is the ring of polynomials in three variables. Um, and by the way, I've just created in Sage a polynomial ring in one variable and then did some arithmetic with it. This notation is something that uh, comes up all over in Sage. What this notation means is, and I should spend a little time and write something, I think. It means create the object R given by Whatever is over here, um, if, it, if it has various generators, like a polynomial ring, which has this sort of distinguished indeterminates, then name that indeterminate what's given in the brackets and assign what's in the brackets to that indeterminate. So after this one line, x is now the indeterminate of this polynomial ring in one variable. And now I'm able to do arithmetic with that polynomial. If you just fired up Sage and typed this expression without doing this up here, um, you get exact, I mean, well, you get something that looks like this, except it wouldn't be expanded out. Um, the default, if you don't do anything at all, and just fire up stages, that x is sort of a formal indeterminate in the sense of calculus. However, when I do that, when I execute this line, I reassign x to be not just some, you know, indeterminate in the sense of calculus, but to be specifically the generator of, or I guess the generator of the polynomial ring q and join x. So that's what's happening right here. And when you, when you do this, um, with the polynomial ring, elements are always expanded out. You can't do things like take sine of x or anything here, because that doesn't make sense as an operation in this polynomial ring. Um, arithmetic is potentially much faster here than it would be if x is just some formal indeterminate. Because here you know that everything involved, once you do the arithmetic, is in this polynomial ring. So, um, I don't expect you to magically understand this one line just like that, but there's really a lot going on here. Um, the second line... I have a question. Yes, please. So the is ro is ring command, does it check all the axioms to see if a group, if whatever you have specified the set is a ring, or is it, Not, is it a ring according to... It's a ring according to a class hierarchy. Okay. So in Sage, there are a whole bunch of different classes, um, in the sense of like object-oriented programming. and. Um, 
One of the base classes is called ring. And this function is ring simply checks to see whether the class for this particular R derives from that base class. That's all it's doing. So you could make up your own class that you know, just has various methods, and you say, I call this a ring, but it's not going to have any effect on this command. Okay? Um, so if you look here, if you type class of R, we redefine R to be the integers mod 12, then, oh, uh, sorry, type of R. Oops. Oops, again. Okay, my E isn't working. Ah, so, um, the class of the ring of integers mod 12 is sage.rings.integer mod ring, integer mod ring generic. And this derives from you know, some other ring type. So that's what this ring is testing. It's testing something about the type of this particular object. In Sage, um, things that conceptually are possibly infinite large objects, like polynomial rings or um, algebraic varieties or, um, I don't know, the set of all prime numbers, all these sorts of objects are objects in Sage just like anything else. So the number five is a perfectly good object in Sage that you can work with. But another thing that's a perfectly good object in Sage that you can work with is the set of all prime numbers. So even though it's an infinite object, um, it doesn't stop Sage at all from kind of formally having that as a normal thing. Because just like you, when you think about math, you certainly have in your mind the object, which is the set of all primes. Just because it's infinite doesn't stop you from thinking about it. And the same goes for Sage. And the sort of, I mean, you can't do very much with this. You can say for P and primes, you know, print P, and it's just going to, uh, maybe I should. <laughs> it's greater than a thousand break. Um, otherwise, print p. So now it's just going to go crazy printing primes for a while, and then it'll give me a link to. You see your shadow right now. Oh, sorry. So it gives me a link to the full output. Um, you can also say, do things like, you know, it's five in primes, so you can find out. Oh. You can find out if five is a prime. So it's the way to do primality testing. Um, or so when the next prime year will be, uh, 2011. So um, there are lots and lots of different objects in Sage. Just, they're just like element. I mean, they're just instances of certain classes. But they're objects that are not just the elements that you have in mathematics, but also the higher level structures, like groups, rings, sets, all these sorts of things. They're first class, just like anything else, objects in Sage. Okay, does that sort of answer your question? Good. So going on, um, this is just a different notation for making a polynomial ring, if you put square brackets, we should enlarge this a little. If you put uh, square brackets after a ring, that's just the same, that's almost the same as putting polynomial ring around it. It's just a shorthand notation that's a little bit quicker to type. That's all it is. Um, so for example, if I do, if I take a ring like this one right here, and then I say S angle brackets T equals R, like that, that makes a polynomial ring over, in one variable, capital T, over the polynomial ring of three variables, over the rational numbers. And let's check it out. There it is. And you can keep iterating this all you want. It's kind of fun. You can you know, then make the polynomial ring in A, B, C, D, E, F uh, over S. And there it is. See, that's a multivariate polynomial ring in three variables over a univariate polynomial ring in one variable over a multivariate polynomial ring in three variables over the rational numbers. And you can build up uh, complicated objects this way. And in fact, um, in, in mathematics at least, most rings you'll ever be concerned with, you can start with either the integers or, well, actually you can just start with the integers and add things in at joint variables, quotient out by relations, add in variables, quotient out by relations, and get up to pretty much any ring imaginable, uh, at least any countable ring. Uh, in Sage, it doesn't necessarily work so well to do that. Probably that's what you're, you're smiling about. But um, in theory, you can do that. Uh, let's see, now I'm going to skip ahead. Oh, there's an example of quotienting out where what you do is you take a ring um, right here. So remember, our ring R was just, let me recopy it, x, y, z, 
So it's just a polynomial ring in three variables. So in mathematics, that's denoted Q joint X, Y, and Z. In other words, if you take the set of all polynomials in three variables, that has an addition, add two polynomials. It has a multiplication, you know about multiplying polynomials. If you go through and check the axioms, it's an example of a ring. And now here what we're doing is we're, quote, quotient out by this relation, which means we're setting that equal to zero. And then we get a ring where it's just like polynomials in three variables, but whenever we see uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, that's just equal to zero. So it's, a, it's actually a very powerful construction to think about. Um, here, if you take x squared plus y squared in the quotient, then that's equal to minus z squared, or minus z bar squared, because I named it that way. So that's this quotient construction. But if you take adjoining variables and quotient, you can do absolutely anything. You can construct any ring imaginable that's uh, countable. All right, the very last thing to show you is fields. A field is just a ring where if you take all the non-zero elements of the ring, then that's a group under multiplication also. Okay, that's all. So if you know what a ring is, you know what a field is. It's just a little bit more. Um, so an example of a field is the rational numbers. Because every non-zero element, like 5, has an inverse in the rational numbers. In the integers, you don't have an inverse, but in the rationals, you do. So there you are. This is a couple of examples of fields. If you take the numbers modulo 7, that's a field. If you take the numbers modulo 12, it's not a field, because there are non-zero numbers mod 12 that don't have an inverse. For example, 2. You can't find any number so that when you multiply it by 2, so you can't find any number when you multiply it by 2, it leaves a remainder of 1 modulo 12. It's just not possible. You can check that. Um, so. Uh, here's another example of a field. So the <coughs> complex numbers of 53 bits of precision, uh, that's not really a field. Complex numbers, that's a field. In a computer, you can't work exactly with complex numbers, so you work with them to some precision. It turns out that doesn't form a field. Um, you can find two particular complex numbers with 53 bits of precision, or maybe three of them, where when you plug in the axioms, they, they simply don't work. That's going to be one of your homework problems. You'll find that something breaks down. And this set, which is a finite set, of numbers of 53 bits of precision, it's a huge but finite set, this is not a field because of various round off errors. Okay? So watch out. Uh, because if you reason assuming all the field axioms are true with the field and then expect a computer to really work that way, and the objects you're working with are you know, numerical objects, it might not work. Okay, so I'm done. The one last comment I want to make is that this whole idea of really making rings and fields and spaces of matrices and all these sorts of things, objects that are first class objects in your system, just like polynomials and fractions and all that sort of thing, is very, very uncommon in mathematical software. If you look at um, Mathematica, Maple, uh, Paris, lots of different programs, none of them do this. Only, the only one that does this very well is Magma and Sage falling in the path of Magma. Likewise, I think, does this pretty well. But it's a really, um, it's a distinct idea, which in mathematics you do all the time, but in computation, people very rarely do, which is that a ring is just an object like anything else. And uh, John Cannon, who's the guy who started Magma, who you can barely see right there, um, but if you download the slides, you'll be able to see. Um, he's really the guy that pioneered this idea in the Magma computer algebra system. So you can just barely see that. All right, so, um, I'll see you on Friday for more mathematics.